And so one of the things that we're going to talk about today is saying, okay, if you've gotten all the fundamentals down, or if you haven't even started on some of the fundamentals, what are some ways that you can kind of get the ball rolling or start moving in a direction where you can turn marketing from a cost center into a profit center? And how does all of that come together? And so just out of a show of hands, how many of you have built a new website in the last two years? How many times have you updated it since? Probably looked fun. Fantastic. Bought ads in a print publication. Ooh. How many of you have dabbled in Google ads with pay per click and things like that? How successful do you feel? Moderately? Fantastic. So, one of the things that we also see a lot of is people turn around and say, yeah, you know what, we've done this, we stopped, then we turned around and done that, didn't work either, and we stopped, but there's never really been any cohesion between all of it. And that's kind of what we're going to go into a little bit more detail about. What are some of the things you can do to start connecting all of these threads so you don't have a whole bunch of different individual marketing tactics working without an overall strategy. And that's what we'll really kind of dip into and ultimately, hopefully, answer your questions. So I do have a bit of a weird confession to make. I was originally going to be a high school history teacher. So I'm fairly used to people nodding off when I start talking. <laughs> However, this is not a classroom. 
If you have questions or want more information about something I'm talking about, stop me, throw up my hand. My team interrupts me and prefers I not complete my sentences as much as possible. Um, but so as we go through this, don't be afraid to ask questions. So let's say you have a new website. Or you finally have set up that LinkedIn page. One of the big questions that you've got to ask is, it's asked all the time, well, now what? What should we do? And that's kind of the where we're going to like to say, stop. Stop trying to pick individual things and start with a much broader strategy. So when, when you've got all of these tools and your foundation set, it's fantastic. But before you start, like, trying to build a all-out program, let's start and look strategically. We want to start at that 30,000-foot level before we start putting troops on the ground, running at like LinkedIn ads or running Google ads without any real thought to, okay, what is that user experience or what is that customer journey like to have a cohesive experience with your companies? And so, Getting started, we like to talk about saying, okay, you know what? Let's start with the end in mind. When was the last time you sat down and said, okay, what do we want to get out of all of this? Do we need five new clients? Do we need 50 new clients? Do we need another $500,000 in pipeline? Do we need another $5 million in the pipeline? What should we expect for bookings? How, how many leads do you need to score a booking? That conversion rate. And we're gonna look with that and say, okay, let's kind of work backwards. We can say, okay, we know out of the 25 marketing qualified leads or MQLs we get from the website, we know, okay, let's say 10% of those will convert to full blown opportunities. And then out of those, how many of those convert to actual Clients. And so we'll kind of look at this, figure out, say, okay, let's do some math in reverse. That's the only way I can do math very well. Uh, and map that out, just figure out, okay, so for us to get three new clients this year, we know that we're going to say, we're, okay, we're going to need 50 qualified leads. And we know that. To get 50 qualified leads, we're going to have to get X number of impressions on Google Ads, or we're going to need to get Y number of uh, impressions on LinkedIn, and start kind of building that process backwards and coordinate that whole concept with finance and leadership. Now, I I understand the challenge that they would just quick show of hands. Are there any people from finance or accounting in here? Okay. I, my wife is a VP of finance for a manufacturing company, so uh, I know that cannot always be an easy alignment between sales, finance, and especially if marketing is separate from sales. That cannot always be fun conversations. But if you can kind of all agree to say, okay, this is this is what we're looking to get out of 2025, that can kind of give your overall marketing plan an excellent place to start. Even before you begin, take a break and talk to five customers, 10 customers. Talk to them to find out what is driving their world. Why are they buying from you? What are the challenges they're facing? And start identifying those pain points because you know if they're experiencing it, there's gonna be 20 other potential customers just like them experiencing that same challenge. That gives you an excellent direction to start as you start building the creative surrounding your marketing. You gotta know what topics you need to push on. Because if one person is, if one of your customers is having quality issues with deliverability or on-time delivery overall, those are things that are going to help Target your marketing message as you're moving ahead. Don't be afraid to even reach out 
clients that are no longer clients. A lot of times you don't want to burn bridges when they're no longer clients, but sometimes turn around saying, hey, you know what? can I ask you a couple questions? Can be a great insight into how they're viewing you and some of even some of the pain points that you might be able to identify with your marketing. Getting the right tools. How familiar is everyone with like Google Analytics and a lot of the, the performance reporting tools, the analytics and LinkedIn and things like that? Those are the kind of things that once you have website set up and everything set up, making sure that you have access to all of that data and are starting to be comfortable with it, air quotes, is super helpful. I know. The new version of Google Analytics, GA4, can be a lot to take in. But there's also a lot of tools that it will help you with to figure out and track how effective your different marketing elements can be. So as we're going through and starting to talk about kind of this overall strategy, making sure that you have the ability to track how well your marketing does, have the ability and have spoken with customers, past, present, and hopefully even future customers, to understand what their challenges are. And finally, that you're going into it with realistic expectations. Because one of the big regrets is sometimes marketing is a long game. It's not always something that you're going to say, OK, we're going to do this in 30 days. We're going to fix our pipe, uh, dry pipeline in 30 days. And that's probably not going to happen. But as you're getting started, those expectations and those plans are super helpful. How do we start getting into creating that strategy? So we're going to start talking a little bit about creation of that strategy. So one of the things we'll look at is like you've got all of this information in from customers. You've got information in from your performance data and say, okay, where is my traffic coming from? Where are my leads coming from? You have all of this information or data gathered. Let's start applying some strategy to it. So you'll want to look at saying, okay, we're going to identify these topics and we're going to figure out what we need to say with those goals in mind. So we're going to look at saying, we're going to put together a calendar. And we always like to say, hey, you know what? Don't be afraid to put a calendar together for the next three months, six months, 12 months. The more organized all of this is at this stage, the easier it will be to implement. Because ultimately, it's, it's always amazing how quickly you say, hey, you know what? We're going to sit down with our principal engineer and talk about material selection. And suddenly, hey, man, we had a great discussion, things like that. We ended up getting a couple different pieces knocked out in that one interview. All of a sudden now, you're starting to develop that kind of shelf of extra content that you need. So putting a calendar together also implement, looks at ways of saying, OK, we know that everyone knows IMTS is happening. What material do we need to go into a show with? whether it's bad tech or whichever show that you're attending, what can we do to help promote the seasonality, especially if you're in an industry that has, okay, we have busy seasons, we have slow seasons, things like that. Creating that content with a calendar, creating content based on a calendar gives you the ability to start applying your marketing at the right time. So looking at that, Create that calendar, mapping that out, and start lining up your subject matter experts. Those people who are in your office that really are, they're the smartest people in the room. They're the people that you, customers really want to talk to and get their opinion about. That's going to be helpful. Keep them very efficient with their time so you're not keeping them off of actual profit making work but also gives you the opportunity to connect with them and get as much information as possible. Those interviews, ultimately, you start, you start building a library of those. Just because you start interviewing people once doesn't mean you can't go back and 
gather that information or reuse that information again later. What kind of content you create is also super helpful. Nobody likes to be on video, even though video is going to be your best weapon when it comes to marketing. Everybody hates it. And guess what? Your first whack at it is going to suck. Embrace it. Recognize that the first one is going to suck. The second one will be just a little bit better. The third one will be, hey, that one, that, that one turned out. By the time you get to your 10th video, you'll look back on that first video and go, oh my god, that, that was horrible. But those little models of improvement go a long, long way. And that's where you can start leveraging that and turning that into an overall very effective platform. But just because video is, possible, is popular doesn't mean that written content is dead either. Using that, creating a, essentially a library of helpful information on your website is going to be beneficial. Yes, with traditional search engines and the direction AI is going, that yep, you want those AI tools scraping your website for expert information as well. As we start looking at that, you're not just becoming thought leaders, you're also becoming a great <coughs> reference library for engineers as well. So as you kind of go through and are talking about that content creation, as you're building all of that, okay, we have all this stuff on the website, what do we do with it? And content distribution is uh, sometimes misunderstood, like it's, okay, we posted our blog post, and that's all we did with it. Well, did you email it out? Did you share it on social media? Did you find other ways to get that information out there? So once you create content, your distribution network becomes something that you do not just once, but over and over again. So when we talk about creating a blog or an article or a video, we're going to say, yes, you're going to have it on your website. You're going to be loading it onto YouTube. And you're going to be having that be the start, not the end of it. So when it comes to social media, those are going to be super valuable resources that you'll share on it. And we can get into specifics about, well, do you really want to put a YouTube link on social media? No. You want to load that video natively on social media. But you're going to want to look at all these different distribution channels as ways of getting it out. And just because you've shared something once doesn't mean you can never post it again. We'll get into some of that a little bit later, but as we also look at it, social media is great, but what if Facebook suddenly decides, you know what, we're done with businesses. We're, we're not gonna allow any business pages anymore. What do you do with all that content? It just all went away. If you're making a whole bunch of videos, Say TikTok goes away. I know parents will celebrate quietly if that happens, but more and more people are using that. Believe it or not, more and more businesses are leveraging it to stay in front of prospects because as you look at it, those engineers aren't getting any older. They're getting younger and younger every time you look. And right now, two thirds of them are doing over 70% of their research online and the amount of that research being done via Google is shrinking very rapidly. That's when we talk about Reddit, Quora, and GitHub. These are Q&A platforms that are becoming overwhelmingly more important <coughs> for you to share your expertise and an opportunity for you to share your content. Right now, a little over 30% of engineers, purchasers, and people of the upcoming generations, I should probably label that millennials and younger, which are currently about 60% of the B2B workforce at this point, are using these platforms 
to share information, ask questions, get answers, and engage. So as we go through and talk about all of that and look at the different components of, oh, we just sent this out, we just sent that out, we posted that on social media, we're just sending out an email blast, just out of a quick question, how many of you actually send a regular email blast out to your customers, past and present? Got a handful of brave souls, fantastic. That's probably going to be one of the best platforms you can use because you own it. Email is not going away tomorrow, even though TikTok might, Facebook may change policies, things like that, but your email is as forever as we will. Uh, as you're going through this, and everything with your calendar doesn't mean you're doing it once. You can go back and repeat stuff. Because we know that just because you put a LinkedIn post out there, doesn't mean 100% of your audience actually saw it. It doesn't mean that every single person actually consumed that content. So you're going to want to look at the content and marketing elements you're putting out there. Hey, make sure you go back and revisit some of that content a month later, a few weeks later. Hey, guess what? It's three months ahead of this trade show. You know what? Maybe we need to pull that recap video we made at the close of last conference and put that back out there. So just because you use content once doesn't mean it's done. So content, when you're using it, doesn't all have to be the same size and the same method. So one of the things that we have found is super helpful is you know what, let's say you know, you've created that brand origin video. You've been able to capture the whole thing beautifully, talking about your facilities, talking about your services. You have some background, and maybe the CEO talking about just how the company was founded. You know what, that was a phenomenal three minute video. But maybe you just want to lift out that section talking about specifically your capabilities. Maybe you want to separate that segment specific for a specific vertical that your business is really targeting. You can go through and take those large bits of content and start breaking it down. So that long brand origin video, sure, it's going to live on YouTube and do fantastic. But we're going to pull a couple of those highlight videos out. Each one of those are going to be maybe a minute long. And from each one of those, we're going to say, okay, you know what? That one little laughing bit the CEO had about funny story about when we expanded this, suddenly that might be a really humanizing element that you can use on social media. And all of a sudden you pull out four or five of those. So from that one brand story video, all the way down, that one video, some of you may have eight or 10 pieces of content that you actually get out of it. So as you're going through it and mapping out this entire strategy of what to do next, just because you do one piece of content doesn't mean that is only one piece of content you'll get out of it. Look at it and see how can we break it down. But the reverse can also be true. If you're looking at saying, okay, you know what, we have four different verticals that we're focused on. You know what, we're, we're doing small video segments of each. You know what, maybe you can work backwards and combine it to say, all right, we have a full capabilities video now combined together from all of these different video segments. What's nice as you're going through and looking at being able to apply all of this content is with all of the performance tracking tools that are available out there, you can see which ones resonate the best. You can see which ones are performing the best, getting the most interest, getting the most engagement to figure out, okay, well, we know that this information really resonated well with contract manufacturers. So since we need to increase that vertical and what we were trying to get from there, we're gonna create more videos like this. So looking at, this model, whether you're going from the top down or the bottom up, 
gives you the ability to start framing and giving good examples of what you can do next with your content. So one of the things that we run into all of the time is so many businesses are sitting there saying, oh man, you know what, that sounds great, but we don't have anyone in-house who can write. We don't have anyone who can do video. All of that comes together. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to kind of share is, you know what, it's okay to use freelancers. Unless you want to talk to a marketing agency or something separately, we can help you with that. But we also recognize that, you know what, maybe you don't need an agency. Maybe you just need, hey, we need a Cracker Jack writer. So you can find maybe a plug on freelance.com. Upwork.com, you might be able to score a fantastic video editor. Fiverr, you need someone to put together those social media graphics. The big thing with all of those is they can execute for you as long as you have that broader strategy in mind. If you're looking for ideas, strategies, and different tools that you can do uh, on your own, um, a couple great uh, websites that talk specifically about B2B and manufacturing marketing, uh, Content Marketing Institute, CMI has phenomenal information, tips, and ideas. Marketing Profs, that's a a little further down the rabbit hole, but does a great job of giving you great how-to advice. HubSpot, um, if you are in the CRM world, they are obviously a major player, um, but they also do a phenomenal job of helping educate how to execute the broader marketing strategies in a really effective way. And if you're looking for kind of a little more lighthearted take on actually some pretty over, overarching social media strategies. Social Media Examiner, uh, Jeff Stelter, is a really, really good resource to look at different tips and ideas. So, some other insider tips. As you go forth into your marketing journey, coordinating <laughs> all of it, even if you have a stable full of great freelancers or contractors, coordinating all of it will take time. That's something that if you're looking for a set it and forget it <coughs> style of marketing, it's probably not going to work very well. It's going to take some hands-on involvement from someone in-house, but that also helps you keep your best interests in mind. Results don't come overnight. Um, I would love to have like a miracle weight loss drug that would take me back down to my high school fighting weights, but that just doesn't happen. Uh, same kind of concept with marketing. Um, you can map out short-term gains, but the true success will come long-term. And if you're on board, and especially if you can have leadership embrace the whole concept of this is a long game, you're going to really be able to start pointing to successes, especially when you start weighing it quarter over quarter, year over year, and get that kind of you know, if you pack the snowball real tight. Nobody wants to talk about snow quite yet, but if you pack that snowball real tight and start rolling it down the hill, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Same concept with marketing. You get it going, you get it rolling, it starts becoming one of those self-fulfilling so what would you say the typical timeline is that you guys see with your customers from, okay, let's do this, to six to 12 months? months. Six to 12 months. It's realistically, we've seen um, one of the best examples we had was uh, actually got started during COVID. So it was everything that always has an asterisk with it. Um, so they really started seeing a success start coming in like that six to 12 month range. Um, they're a thermoform plastics and extruded plastics manufacturer up in Wisconsin with us. 
Um, and it's one of those things that if you can embrace the strategy and really help in terms of lining up those interviews with your in-house people, helping get the content put together and uh, being that ready resource for like a team like ours, that's where we can start really rolling stuff out on a regular, consistent basis. And that's where you're gonna start seeing the needle move in that six to 12 month time frame. Especially once you have, you start with that strategy, get everything rolling, and that's where you start seeing results stack up. You guys agree? Um, one of the things that we ran into fairly recently is that um, we were running a content marketing program for one of our clients and they, were, they found out that sales weren't getting back to them. A lead would come in and it would sit for two weeks. You have someone who goes through the process to fill out that contact form, request a demo, request a quote, go through all the whole process. Getting back to them within one to two business days is paramount. Shorter is better. That speed to lead concept is super helpful. So making sure that if someone's gone through and contacted you, get back to them right away. Every content marketing program, whether you do it yourself or partner with an agency, hits this formal spot probably about three to five months in. You've been at it. You're paying for it. But that needle just isn't quite moving yet. It is super easy for you to say, you know what? We're going to back out. And that's where most often it's like, but you know what? Success is just a little bit further beyond that. And so keeping at it, knowing it's a long game, is going to be super beneficial long term to see the overall success. So I know I have been planning on, but one of the most important things here is finding out questions that you have and how we can help. I know I got emailed a couple questions ahead of time um, that I can have the rest of our team answer. But if you've got questions about graphic design or photography, videography, we've got Corey here. Strategy, operations, project managers, or just how we get started in Hannah and just making sense of all things social, Alexia will be happy to help. Um, but does anyone have any questions right out of the gates? I do. How, how often do you recommend that like a manufacturer should kind of refresh their website? Great question. When you refresh your website, typically, I like to make a cell phone comparison. How often are you buying a new cell phone? Probably every about two to three years. Same concept with the website. Typically technologies and everything refresh enough where looking at your website again every two to three years is a good idea. Now, sometimes you might be able to get away with saying, hey, you know what, we're going to refresh the website or make some changes to it, not necessarily blow the whole thing up and start from scratch, but making sure you're reviewing it two to three years is a good idea, as long as you're making sure that you're also making regular updates to the website. And what's the purpose of that refresh? So, like, obviously, you know, what, three years, are we going on three years? About three years since we've done an overhaul. Yeah. Right? And so then we're doing monthly content on the website, you know, blogs, video, right. content, all this stuff. But what does that refresh entail? Do you just need new images? Do you need all, you know, obviously the content keeps changing month to month. Like, <coughs> what's the purpose of that refresh every two to three years? So a couple different things. One, the technology powering websites does come a long way in two to three years. So helping your website load faster, load better for the updated browsers and mobile devices, but also 
People get fatigued by seeing the same images over and over again. So hopefully you're getting people coming back to your website on a regular basis, but that refresh gives them the ability to see something new. It loads better, it performs better, and ultimately also gives you the ability to make adjustments to see, you know what, hey, we've got these three pages, but people really don't go to that. Do you really need them? That kind of ability to reassess your website on what's helpful and what's just extra is going to be super beneficial as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, something we've been kind of struggling with is like developing a strong social media strategy. Um, that's kind of like our social media is like the last, like we, we do a lot of email blasts, like our websites, like all that's good. Our social media is we're kind of like, what do we do? Balancing like content directed towards our customers and then like prospects that end up on our page. Um, and it's like, we struggle with the, like the shorter video clips and like things like that. So I guess like, where would you, start when you're going to sit down and say like, okay we need a stronger social strategy my first thing would be you want to look at what platforms you're on so um like you said you've got customers looking at your content but also potential hires right new employees so um linkedin is where you want to be for your customers um facebook might be where you post your content for your prospective hires culture um that type of stuff so for manufacturing, those are our two focuses. We, we don't want someone saying like, I'm gonna jump into TikTok without having a LinkedIn page, um, you know, or, or not having a Facebook page. You wanna start with those building blocks before you jump into the bigger ones. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have that base. Your profiles are all filled out. Everything is set up correctly. Everything's linked correctly. Your about section is right. Um, you really wanna make sure that that's all there before you jump into a full strategy. Um, and then once you have that set, you want to look at how to best optimize your time. So you said you have video. Um, maybe you start with, hey, I've got one video I'm going to break down into three pieces and schedule it all over the next month. We work a month ahead with our clients um, and we build these calendars and they, they know and we know what's coming up. Um, and then you can kind of look ahead for other, is it National Manufacturing Month? You know, is it that type of stuff? Like, Look ahead. Don't say I need to start today. Okay. Well, I'd say after doing all that, I would try to optimize it so that all your socials flow across like all the all the platforms that you're going to have. Okay. Thank you. Probably one other thing to add on to that, especially with LinkedIn. Posting to your company page is great, but making sure you have people sharing that content also on their personal pages. Because especially with LinkedIn, the sum of your employees are going to far exceed the reach of your company page. So they're going to be your secret sauce in terms of getting better reach engagement with your company page stuff. Got it. Yeah, so going into that, yeah, so for example, our company has uh, X many followers, but they're not really who we want to target. So I try, I've been working on making that happen. So I invite people to follow our, our, um, our company QFC account. But you know, that doesn't really, you don't get as much as you think you're going to get. So yeah. what I do is repost what we post. So for, for example, right before I left, I repost those with my own comments. <coughs> but my question I want to ask is, are, how important are hashtags? So are they still on the platform? <laughs> Are no longer clickable sometimes on LinkedIn. So 
LinkedIn is slowly phasing out the clickable hashtag because they want to control how the algorithm works instead of people putting in hashtags that they want to hurt for. So <clears throat> let's say I'm writing a post about hashtags, but I put <coughs> manufactured marketing as a hashtag, but I didn't mention that in my caption. LinkedIn doesn't want me to force that into that speed if I'm not actually talking about it in the caption. So they want to control the conversation. Next question. I'm sorry for dominating this question. Uh, so, in in the most recent um, post that we did, and I reposted right before I left. So, I was at the assembly show the past couple of days downtown. So, I tagged Assembly Magazine. Is that a obviously a strategy because then that helps to connect out there or push out there? So yeah, so we tag TMA when we post about being here. It's really only beneficial if they're also active. So, assuming they are, <coughs> yes, it's very beneficial. They're, they're, they might share it, it might, people might, that follow them might see that content. So, yes. Yeah, some of the is really Yeah. Yeah, yeah to kind of recap. Tagging people will go a lot further than a hashtag. And then, how about tagging your own company name in? The, the post as well. That helps with the SEO. As as a company post or as a personal post? So I'm, I'm reposting something, but I want to mention something about QX Impact. So I'll say at you know. Sort of. But it's your personal page. Yeah. That's beneficial for sure. Okay. Yeah. Because then people who follow you will see that, and also people who follow your company page might get shown your posts. Okay. Yeah. But if our marketing team put out the post and they uh, tag ourselves in the that what kind of counter to you? Yeah, I don't think that I'm not I don't I don't think that does anything. Um, I work at a smaller um, metal spinning company uh, and I'm the sales engineer. So I don't have too much marketing experience. Um, and a lot of times some of the marketing stuff falls in some of the marketing responsibilities fall within my responsibilities. Um, we already have a website and LinkedIn page and some other socials, but um, it's hard for me to stay consistent sometimes with some of our strategies and plans. And I'm not sure what is right and what's wrong. So I was just gonna, I was wondering what you think as starting out, what are some important strategies and tactics that should be? I think that's actually my question. It is. Yeah, so kind of the first three things you said. Um, you have a LinkedIn page. Yeah. So the most important thing is if you have a Facebook or LinkedIn page, just to make sure it's fully populated. You have your your logo is your profile photo. The top of LinkedIn has the cover photo. You don't want that to be the gray box. You want it to be something, not a stock photo. Go out on your floor and take a nice photo. It's social media, so it doesn't need to be Corey's fancy camera. It can be off of your cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, Make sure it's you. Same thing with the about section. You want um, you can customize buttons. So if you want people to contact you, you can change that to do what you want it to do. So really make sure that your profile is filled out both on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, it's like the stat is like you get thirty percent more engagement just if you have all of that done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is um, in marketing in general, not just social media. Have you claimed a Google business account? If someone Googles I think we have your location, Google. can they click to your website? Can they see some photos? Have you answered any questions? Do you have any reviews from customers? That needs to be populated um, and maintained on a regular basis, almost that bi-monthly basis. Yeah. To chime in just how important your Google business profile has become, that profile with reviews and other posts you have in that has become just as important as the technical SEO on your website. So making sure your Google business profile is complete is probably one of the best things you can do to give your overall SEO a shot in the arm. And then the third thing is, um, like Matthew, I guess it kind of find your cheerleaders, find your happy customers, find your employees, and use them to help create content. So you're one person can't do it all, yeah. but maybe there's a floor manager that can take some pictures for you, or maybe there's another sales guy who can send stuff when he's out on sales calls or with meeting with clients, that type of thing. So find partners within your organization to help you with 
content and staying on top of that yeah. stuff. Yeah, uh, sometimes I get busy with other things um, and I kind of neglect this, which I regret, regret doing. So I want to, you know, be more consistent with it. Like you said, to, you know, setting more attainable goals is something I think we should do. And um, that's why I was curious, I guess, on other, you know, key strategies. That we, I guess another good one would be scheduling. So like, like yeah. sitting down the first week of the month and taking some of your top industries, projects, services, and just scheduling out content. It's evergreen. It doesn't matter if it's raining or snowing out. It'll post fine. You know, it's not something that you need to change based on where you are in the day or something like that. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So those types of things we do a lot for clients when they aren't getting back to us about new content. We're posting yeah. their, you know, about section. We're posting their sales guys. That type. Yeah, their old blogs. Like just making sure that you're getting a consistent content out on those platforms. Yeah. So just, you know, and I think if for someone that knows the company, an hour at the beginning of the month yeah. to schedule four posts out is gonna be super beneficial to get you started. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have nice testimonials on our website, but we don't have any Google reviews. Yeah. How do we request from a client to say, do a Google review? Can we send them a link or? A Believe it or not, <laughs> uh, Google, uh, Google's business profile, you log into, you can actually, they'll give you a link, they'll even give you a QR code that if you want to like put something up in your lobby or your trade show, you can do that. But you can, here's a link and Google will send them, hey, we'd love to get a Google review from you. Click here and fill it out. And they have really made it a lot easier to do. And like I said, uh, I think if there was any golden tip to any business right now is leveraging that can have fantastic effects, um, long term especially. But don't be afraid and don't be afraid to when someone posts that review, post a response. Because when someone puts that review, Google is scanning that for keywords. Turn around and make sure your response actually goes through and says, Hey, thanks. We're great that you enjoyed the custom XYZ project. Next time you think, did you know we also do custom grinding? Things like that. All of a sudden you start getting some of those back and forth review responses. Then you've got a lot of keywords and a lot of content Google is scanning and associating with your business, ultimately helping your organic search performance. Does that make sense? Makes sense. About a year ago, Signal Fire had three reviews. Yeah. And we, there's another project manager who's not here, Tiffany and I, took a bunch of clients, split it up, and sent personal emails to them. Hey, we want to, you know, we preach to our clients all the time Google reviews. Can you help us out? You're a long time client, or we just finished a project for you. And that got us up to what, 10? Now, I think we're in the 15 one. range because we put it into our standard operating procedure. We finish a website launch, we finish a rebranding project, we send them a thing, hey, it's great working with you. If you feel the same, can you do me a favor to fill out this for you? It's probably one out of four do right. it, but it's still one, right, that you didn't get before. So. Yeah. I'll let you to our rest. <laughs> Another question I had is, I guess, what do you think is a more impactful type of social media post? Because um, a lot of times I notice, like when you go on LinkedIn, you see the activity, um, the posts that have, you know, people or faces in them, they get more activity and more impressions. But I feel like our target market, which is engineers and you know, the supply chain coordinators or buyers at other companies, the target, you know, content they're looking to see is more of like a manufacturing processes and metal spinning and machining. Um, so I guess what I guess you know we could post both. But if I were to post one, what do you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of both, I yeah. feel like, because people do like to see, like, I'd say, like, the machinery and, like, the process and stuff, but they do want to see, like, the culture of the company, especially if it's on, like, here. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's hard. Human to humans. We like to buy from people we like. Yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> if you can show that both component of it, show that you're human beings. But I know, like, cold spinning is an uphill sell, no matter, uh, no matter how you're doing it. Yeah. Um, but, 
I think when you do the manufacturer side, if you can answer those, oh, here's the top 10 myths of spinning aluminum or something like that. Yeah. Those are the kind of things that I think will marry very well with those cultural posts that make sure the human side. Yeah. You also have to remember that not everybody's going to see everything. So let's say an engineer sees one of the technical posts and they click on your page and then they scroll through your posts. You want to show them variety. That's so, right. yes, yeah, so you want to make sure that. And something else to build on remember, people are also searching in social media as well. Yeah. They're going up to a search bar and typing in phrases, keywords. Search is no longer purely the domain of Google. I mean, the number two search engine in the world is YouTube. So that's that's going to become an important component. So, Tom, uh, just going back to the plain and your Google thing. Uh, we're a electronic contract manufacturer, so we yep. build a lot of stuff for our team. But we also have a product of our own, that's and so I basically have a totally different website where I probably get reviews for that, but there's no, you know, when you say, I can't do a different business, I mean, any, any suggestions? You can have multiple business cohabitating a singular location. So, um, but it's a brand name, really, it's not a, it's still under the title. Okay, yeah. We, we've got a client doing the exact same thing right now. Yeah. They're uh, a plastic extruder that makes also a ground mat for uh, landscape. Okay. So what they've done is they've created a completely separate Google business profile for that company under the product name and then gone through the verification process that way. And it's allowed them to have that separate business profile, separate from the manufacturing side of it. So it's just under the same address. It's just under the same address. Okay. I, okay. Uh, in terms of building the reviews and building the components of it, I still say, yep, dive hard in, but you should be able to jump a hole. I think we get more reviews on that. Oh, absolutely. Because everything we do is under an NDA, so it's very difficult to do anything with content. And a lot of our stuff is eye tiring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's yeah. it's a very common challenge what you're experiencing. Go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts on email blasts? Like just to the, like prospects leads, like to the masses. Like we do like campaigns where we target it a little more, but like we've tried to do just like a general last and like we usually don't find a lot of success and like we don't know if it's the content if it's just because people don't open emails that seem like a blast one of the biggest challenges with any kind of cold email blast is surviving inbox triage we all do it we sit there in the morning and go bleep 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 <laughs> going through surviving that so when you have a purchased list especially that becomes some very gray area, both legally and success. Um, understanding out of that segment, what their top pain point is, and capturing that in the subject line is your best chance for success. So really, your email battle will be won or lost in the subject line in those 60 characters that get displayed on your mobile device. That's where your whole battle is. Keeping it short, sweet, and one singular call to action. And, and human, um, B2B email newsletters tend to be very dry. The best success we've had even with mass emails is using emojis, using slang, using gonna instead of going to. Um, you're still emailing people, you're not emailing a company. Okay. So play around with those subject lines. It's the most important part of the email. Which is Thank you. Along that lines, are you finding that with the last like things that are being sent out of like Mailchimp or any of those services are getting blocked more than coming out of a personal email address? A couple things are happening in that world right now, um, and we're we're in the process of 
taking our, a lot of our customers through this. So there is becoming uh, an increased requirement of validation that you're a real business and not a, a spam company out of Russia blasting everybody. Um, so if you are able to go through that verification process, if anyone wants to geek out with me on it, I would be happy to put on that money back. Uh, they hate it when I do. Um, but looking at that and saying, making sure you're following the rules with that, MailChimp, uh, HubSpot, Campaign Monitor, whichever platform you're using will have that validation recommendation. Go through that process. It's very much worth it. That will help with email deliverability. Now, a couple other things that will also impact that. A lot of your end recipients are starting to have more and more stringent spam filtering and kind of spam vocabulary. Making sure that that subject line really focuses on relevant terminology for them is going to be helpful. If you're talking about free giveaway or X percent off, you know, if that's great if you're pottery barn, but if you're a regular B2B manufacturer, that's not where it's going to be at. So crafting the right subject lines will help even further with that once your domain is fully valid. Yeah, we've been kind of getting around, like we, we have a MailChimp thing, we haven't used it in probably a year yep. because we find better results just sending it out of our CEO's inbox or sales guys directly. And we just do like a mail merge out of it and it's a little bit more work, but and my, my sales guys talk a lot about mail merge the last couple months. Yeah. But. It also depends on the list size. Yeah. You might be harming your domain okay. if you're sending those out and people are recording those or flagging those as spam. So that's where using a platform like MailChimp or those things may be more beneficial okay. for your domain's reputation. Because ultimately you don't want that, let's say you email your invoices out to your customers, you don't want those to end up getting shoved in spam because the email server got flagged for sending too many cold emails. Yeah, we don't do it that frequently enough to make it happen, I think. I think we're good there, but uh, we try to make it pretty targeted, but it's still Frequency is less as important as the number. Yeah. So if you're sending it out to 150, 200 people, yeah, you should be fine. Okay. If you're sending it out to 5,000 people from one of their email addresses, yeah, you're going to be in trouble. I still have a point if I had 150 emails going out of their inboxes. <laughs> Perfect. One of the things we do is we have we have a separate domain name, name so it's post our domain name. Okay. We make it look like it's coming from our regular domain name, but that way if that gets if your domain name gets uh, flagged like you're talking about, you get to get where nobody's getting anything from your name, yeah. and they just kind of shut you down. Yeah. So so if you can you know whatever your name is, maybe have something a little bit extra with an S that you can any go get you know. Just, get something different and then and then use that but get it someone that knows how to do that where they have it look like it's coming from one email and not the other um, and if you're using a purchase list don't use your root domain because those purchase lists a lot of times will have what are called spam traps in them that their email address is specifically flagged to go to spam reporters and they will often get missed. So if you're buy, buying something from like Zoom Info or something like that, buyer beware, you're, you're gonna get dinged by that. What's your thoughts on this? I've never had success and I, I try to apply them. I, I, I prefer to buy avoid it. them like the plague yeah. because we, when our clients bring us those purchase lists, we actually go through a scrubbing process. And when we scrub them, man, we're taking out 40% of those email addresses because they're just out of date. The company's no longer in business or there are specifically spam traps that are there that will get their domain reputation in trouble. So what advice do you give for companies if they, like what if we do want to obtain a, a list of whether it's leads or emails or what, like, do you have any advice for sources for that kind of stuff? 
couple of a uh, couple of places um, would be a good idea if you're going if you're participating in a trade show, where the people who are submitting the email addresses know that hey, I'm going to be getting that information. Going to a company like and I keep using Zoom Info or there's a, a variety of them out there. The challenge with those lists is they're not always acquired legally. Yeah. And so you're better off partnering with an organization like TMA and using the tools they have to reach out to your target community. Use those tools because those purchase lists may come back to bite you a lot harder than the extra legwork it will take to build your own list over time. And a good, actual, relevant email address can't be worth as much as three to five dollars, quote unquote, on the street. So if you're looking to say, okay, hey, I want to get good, legit email addresses from 250 people, that's kind of a pretty good price tag. But could those same people be invited to subscribe legally to your email newsletter because you target them with LinkedIn, the right LinkedIn advertising? or you're showing up in a Reddit discussion. As weird as it sounds, Reddit has been a phenomenally active area for B2B manufacturers to get new attention drawn to them because so many engineers right now use those platforms to query each other about, hey, I'm running into this problem. How are you solving it? Oh, I'm running into, I'm running into this problem with this material, who else has done it? Those environments can start getting you better connected and if they can connect with you and say, hey, we're sharing our expertise through a regular email newsletter, suddenly those are going to be the ones that are opening, clicking, and engaging with you to make those email blasts even more impactful. So how do you get yourself involved with Reddit? Go on, make an account. I mean, it's, it's um, and then, and then uh, just I, I'm, wade into the pool and start commenting. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. Uh, it, it sounds overly simplistic, but it's. I started doing it about a year ago, just for signal fire. I was shocked. We had a first phone call in 48 hours. Just and it was that's anecdotal, but I, I was kind of shocked that it's like oh, someone who is actually. For us, that was relatively nearby in Wisconsin, called with a relevant marketing request that quickly. So the objective behind it is that you can use Reddit as not a sales platform, but an information sharing platform, a place where you can share your expertise and your insights. They will find you. They'll say, hey, I, I like what that person had to say. Say we're gonna. I, I want to find this person, uh, and that's where you fill out your Reddit profile correctly and everything. And they'll find you very easily. Is it best to do it under the company name or? I didn't know there are company name, yeah. um, and it seems to work very well. So along the lines of the Reddit thing, so you just win your company name, and then do you just like you just pop on there and comment and start like commenting on stuff? Sorry, this is like a whole. That's a whole. I mean, I. Yep. I as a personal person, I go on Reddit, but like, I guess I've never thought of doing it for my company or so, forcing my engineers to do it because that's like pulling teeth to get any of my experts to do anything. So oh yeah. that's my favorite part. Very so, no offense to the engineer, but <laughs> we have a special engineering tranquilizer done to come yeah. down and down. I, I need five of those. <laughs> um, no, but yes, that is the big challenge. But that's also where you're going to see the best return okay. with something like that is. Say, hey, copy, and maybe cheat. Hey, we had a prospect ask me this question. You pulled it out of Reddit, email it to the engineer. How would you answer this? Let them fire back to you and then share that post gotcha. back. So you just kind of be the one, one person is the essential like answer person. Say, hey, I saw this question here. Can we answer this? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. It's not something a lot of places are doing yet, but it's where a lot of engineers are spending time. Um, 
if you want some great insights into engineers' behavior from a marketing perspective, um, there's a company out of Austin, Texas called True Marketing, T-R-E-W. Um, Wendy Covey and her team are fantastic people. They put out a report specifically every year about the state of marketing to engineers. Hands down, strongly recommend downloading that report. Uh, and they're, they partner with Global Spec, and the data in there is very eye-opening in terms of, okay, so 60% of engineers are actually going to YouTube before they're going to Google for problems. Oh, we need to make sure that we write our YouTube descriptions a little better. So hopefully that will be helpful. Any other questions? Go ahead. When it comes to um, LinkedIn ad targeting, I know obviously who you target depends on the content and the overall objectives. With that said, since you guys are an agency and probably, I believe at the beginning set up, you have a lot of manufacturing clients. Are you finding that ad targeting by industry, by title, or by both has been more successful with the, the conversion rates? For LinkedIn, you said? Yeah. <coughs> I mean, it kind of depends on the client, which is the super, what, what nobody wants to hear. Um, you really want to make sure you know your audience. So we have a lot of clients that want to target anybody at a company, right? But then we also have a lot of clients that, well, I don't want to target the CEO because they're not the people that's using my product. So then they send us a list of 20 job titles that that company might have that we look at. So um, the good thing about LinkedIn is you can use both. And um, I think we've seen the most success with using both. Yeah. But if you don't have a target big enough, well, yeah, or if you don't have a set of companies, then just target job titles, you know, and, and industry. Because <coughs> some some clients don't have a, a list of ideal like dream clients when we come to that. They're like, but I work with purchasing engines, or I work with this in these industries. So then we can try and find companies for them to target. You remember the game Battleship? <laughs> Same kind of concept. <clears throat> Job titles can be one axis, industries can be the other, and yep, you want to try to... A little bit of everything. Yeah, exactly. And it's... I wish there was like a, a one solution fits all situations, but it's going to be a little bit of experimenting as you go. Go ahead. You mentioned in your presentation about giving it like 90 days before you kind of give up on something. Yep. So that applies to like Google Ads as well? Yes. Um, Google Ads are really intended for the long game. They, it takes Google a good probably 60 to 90 days to even know who they're supposed to be showing the ads to. So just trying to say, trying to like play with the light switch on Google to say, we're going to run it for 30 days. Okay, we're going to shut it off. We're going to run it again. Google isn't getting the information it needs to deliver your ads to the correct people in the correct situation. So that's where it's like saying, okay, you've created like, you, we, I prefer to like the daily budget approach. Uh, look at that saying, okay, we know we can allocate this daily budget to run for 90 days. And after 90 days, you're gonna need to be in there to refresh the creative anyways. You're going to want to look at that because there is such a thing as ad fatigue that people looking at these ads have seen them so many times that they, they start getting blind to it. So you need to refresh the creatives. So giving it that 90 days, check on it, but then tweak to advance, but don't shut it off. Make adjustments and continue moving on. Does that make sense? Yeah. I tell clients a lot. Your company, your brand, your main strategy, Google Ads. If you want to target a specific event or a seasonal topic or service, that's where you're going to put LinkedIn and do ads there. Because they can run shorter and still be effective. What kind of budget do you tell your clients to prepare for? 
on Google Ads. If you're going to say, you know, you really need to stick this out for six months. What? So we'll, when we uh, do an assessment, one of the things that we'll do is find out, okay, what are the keywords? And then we can shop those keywords to find out what, how, how expensive they are. Yeah. If you're doing something like plastic contract manufacturing, something like that, hey, you might be able to get away with two to three dollars. You're doing precision machining or Swiss style machining. Well, sometimes those can go up to seven dollars to twenty dollars a click. So it depends on the keywords that you're going to be looking at will ultimately drive your budget. But a lot of times we'll like to say, okay, just knowing, uh, knowing kind of what your conversion rates of things have been in the past, or if you've never done it before, kind of industry standard, we'll want to say, okay, we want to ultimately get you to a couple hundred clicks a month. What will the price tag of that be? And then kind of build the strategy around that. Right. So you, you said you don't want to turn it off and that. But you've got a campaign solution, so I've got a campaign going. Yeah. And I'm trying a new campaign. Is it better to build on an existing campaign and try to use new words? Or is it better to create a new campaign so that I can kind of track that campaign and how it's doing? Will the two campaigns compete against one another if they're running simultaneously? Yeah, so I wasn't going to have them run simultaneously. I was just okay. going to kind of bring the same stuff over to the new campaign. But I kind of want to keep the old campaign because it was working pretty well. I'm, I'm working with somebody else, somebody yep. new, and I want to see how well they do. I would definitely create a separate campaign for that. Okay. Um, <laughs> just because all of your data tracking will be different. Um, and what I would uh, look to see if you can do is you should be able to, in the linking, uh, that campaign should be able to be tracked differently in Google Analytics and in the activate. So you can clearly see the difference in performance. Okay. okay. So I can shut the one, but I'm trying to. You, you can pause it. I'm going to pause the one. Yeah. Okay. Just again, we don't want That's what I suggested to the beta and the pie and the set of 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 the you want to go back and be able to turn the person back on. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to lose what I had because yep. they made all these changes. Mm -hmm. So, fantastic. Okay. Well, go ahead. SEO will be one of our strategies next year. So, what are some of the key things that we should be doing to help increase our positioning in, in searches? The world yeah. of SEO and search right now is about to go through. Uh, a nuclear level change. Um, with the Google has used AI for probably about 10 years to help with algorithm updates and changes to search behavior. What we're seeing happen now is organic search results are getting pushed further and further down, and you have what are called zero click searches dominating your search results. So this will be like an AI summary of the question you asked Google, and that and your organic performance suddenly now is floating right there with Jimmy Hoffman's body on page two. So it's really becoming a question of saying, okay, do you want to necessarily invest in organic search performance, or do you want to target the person doing the search with your other content and marketing distribution channels. Because once someone is there making a Google search, believe it or not, their buying decision is already two thirds done. They're using all these other distribution channels to do the research using Google to validate that. So if you're going to dive into SEO, the question is, is like, okay, is it necessarily organic search engine optimization we need to do? Or do we need to optimize our content for how those AI tools are scraping our website for content? How are those, uh, where are those potential buyers 
connecting with us, would we be better off creating a video in YouTube answering the question that they're plugging in there to have them come across when they're doing that high level search in YouTube, not Google. So kind of understanding your buyer and their journey to you or their journey to a solution is probably going to be a better investment than just saying, hey, we want to hit organic search performance. Because that might not be where your customer is looking for you. You may have a great foot in the door at that kind of top level question or you might be able to hit them when they're a lot further down in their decision planning process, demonstrating like your expertise on cutting or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry, I know there was another hand up. I guess uh, I'm kind of curious and hearing a little bit more about that. Like, so in what ways does optimizing your content for this new ranking method differ from how you would do it to rank organically? If I had the full solution for that, I would be on the beach somewhere, <laughs> like drinking um, cocktail. Um, go ahead. So right now, kind of like the back end, we can do SEO is they'll use metadata or alt text or um, a plugin on their website to make sure that their description is all in there, all of that good stuff. Google's not going to care about that going forward. They're going to care if people think your content is valuable. So they're going to know that someone watched the video that you posted on LinkedIn, but it's also the same video that's on your YouTube page that has the keywords in the description that are also the same keywords on your website. It's going to tie it all together because it knows you're the same company. So it's all about being helpful, answering questions, being valuable to your customers, and not necessarily having all the text on your photos, which you still need to have, but that's not going to help you with the search. So it's this broader goal of making sure everything is linked across all of your platforms. And so things like how long they're spending on your website, it's becoming far more of a ranking value than necessarily how high in the search report, uh, search engine results page you appear. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or if you put up a YouTube ad and they click to your YouTube page, that's going to be more valuable than someone going to Google and it's, it's all connected. It's getting people to make that extra step to find out more about me. Why is this person helping me? Why is this company providing me with this information? That's it. I have a question. Okay, so CMA is the Arbitrary Association of the 501C6. Yep. But we also have the foundation, which is the 501C3, that we're trying to like launch at a more serious capacity. We do not have a separate website for the foundation yet. We don't have a separate LinkedIn for that foundation yet. What is the best way to go about leveraging like CMA's following? Like if we create this, this whole like new brand, it's like the same, it's a separate entity, but it's like all associated so closely together, which is I think confusing about it. But like, say we were to make a whole new LinkedIn page, like how, what is the best way to like start? that new one by leveraging what we already have created. You know? I know I have. So a few things. What would you say about like the page? No. How do we get every yeah. single person that follows <laughs> so to follow the LinkedIn has showcase pages. Have you heard of those? Yeah. They look exactly like a normal page. Okay. But it's connected to the main page. So it's used a lot of by a lot of companies um, for kind of like what's yeah, on the like how next to here. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what so, you want for your side product. Our thermal yeah. grooming client has their thing, but under that is the ground protection mat showcase page. So we link to it the same post at the same it's got the same profile setup, but it is linked to <coughs> the main page. So all the followers are automatically get pushed over, but they do get shown the content a lot more. Okay. So that would be the first recommendation. Yep, yep, is to create a showcase page under TMA's page, okay. so that they're linked. But even if it can, it'll have a different name. Even if you have a different logo, it can have a little bit of a different look. Um, but it links back. That's my first recommendation. Got it. Cool. Thank you. But in terms of spinning off a separate website, good idea. 
and the way you start directing people there is just start building crosslinks back and forth, and that will help. That will help people kind of start getting over there and yeah. taking them back kind of as separate from yeah. the TMA yeah. website. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's been a whole bunch of questions. If you do have any other questions you want to ask us separately, you can go ahead and scan that. That will take you to a page that tells us a little, tells a little bit more about us and then has a little form at the bottom that you can fill out and I'll give you a call back. Thank you.